the education system in New Zealand is considered one of the best in the world. I hear all the time that New Zealand has this world-class education system, but then I question if it is world-class, then why do we still have that tale of underachievement, which is mainly filled up for Māori and Pacifica children, people from low economic areas. The education system works for some children, but not for all children. 20% of students in the system are considered to be underperforming. The vast majority of these are Māori and Pacifica. These outcomes are shocking, but not surprising when you consider them in the context of New Zealand's past. When European settlers first arrived, they were welcomed by the indigenous Māori people and formed a partnership. But this agreement was quickly exploited, and for generations since, the Māori have endured systemic disenfranchisement at the hands of the state with education serving as a powerful tool of control and indoctrination. I think education's been a deliberate, intentional tool of colonisation and after colonisation then of assimilation. Schools were used to forcefully assimilate Maori children into European culture, teaching children that their own culture was inferior. A lot of the Maori families had very unsavoury experiences in education and school was not a pathway for success. All of those intentional policies designed to, one of the often quoted sayings is, to smooth the pillow of a dying race. The 1970s saw the rise of a Maori renaissance, reclaiming some of the stolen culture and land. But the effects of historical and ongoing oppression can still be seen in the demographics of inequality, with Maori people disproportionately affected by inequities in income, health and education after generation after generation of low outcomes and low expectations for our Māori students, we haven't made a difference. The oppression of the Māori people was rationalised by the colonial ideology of white European supremacy that saw the Māori as an inferior people who needed to be civilised for their own good. This ideology is more subtle than it once was, but the prejudice has not gone away and has been expanded to include people who originate from the Pacific Islands. When they say, for example, that Pacific Island people are dumb, and then we'll just sit there and be like, yeah, we are dumb because we're brown. And those messages are powerful, and they're everywhere. They come from society all around them, they come from television and the media, and they come from our schools. Oh, these people are going to fail academically. Mm -hmm. Their standards are lower than white people. And it's like you have no choice, it's like it's forced on you. Yeah, yeah. It's just those little subtle messages coming out and if you don't look at those things with a critical mind, you won't be aware of it. I think it's just a pattern eh, that keeps happening all the time and it's, it's become so hegemonic. Hegemonic, yeah, it's like a thinking that get, creeps up in your mind but you don't know it's there. These narratives continue to shape how Maori and Pacifica children are perceived and how they learn to perceive themselves. They seem to accept it as being normal that it's normal for them to have health issues, it's normal to have poor housing conditions, it's normal to not succeed in school. This is how it's supposed to be. And even for myself when I was growing up, I used to think that was normal, that just because I was a Tongan brown girl brought up in here in Ōtara, that I wouldn't account to anything. I'm not going to get this or that because I'm brown, or I'm not going to bother apply for this because I'm not going to make it. That's because that's what they were taught. Your identity is formed from the way other people see you and if that's low expectations and it's teachers giving you the impression that what you know and understand is of little value, then you have that picture of yourself. You believe that you almost deserve to be not equal. You tolerate and you accept inequity. If you don't understand what's going on, and we don't understand social justice, all the differences between the majority and the minorities, then of course we're going to be continue to be oppressed because we're just going to keep doing the same thing, living the same cycle. I think we have to look at our kids' positions in society and the ways society has kept young people in those positions. And I think we have to articulate that, we have to name that, and too often we gloss over it. It's not being taught in schools, it's mostly swept under the carpet, that it's sensitive topics, we must never talk about it. When I was at high school, uh, we never critiqued concepts of 
colonisation. We never critiqued assimilation. We certainly didn't have the opportunity to critique words and concepts like hegemony. I was just lucky that I came to the school that I knew otherwise, I was taught otherwise. And that's why I think, that's why I think I was lucky. How is our mainstream media portraying Māori? Highest prison ethnicity in New Zealand. Okay, so they have the highest percentage of incarceration. Yeah. I think the answers and our understandings are in the grey areas. Make some decisions for yourself and for your own understandings around those areas. How well is the media clarifying the grey areas between, between our cultural ignorances, particularly a strong cultural ignorance by the dominant discourse of why is it important for Māori to be able to be Māori, to be able to live as Māori in a very white dominated society. I think it's really important that the learning and the information that's being shared in schools actually has relevance to, to the young people that are sitting in front of the teacher. What are the health statistics? What are the justice statistics? How do those happen and, and why? And how do you change that? What is colonisation? What is assimilation? How is that impacted on me? And it actually helps me to become more critical. So the assessment requires you to critique. It's about understanding and being critical and being critically conscious in your understanding of how the world works. Critical analysis is about understanding the reasons why. We very specifically name what has happened and we study because if we don't give our kids that understanding then they, they think it is their fault. That's overwhelming. Our young people become empowered by that knowledge and that truth. It was like um, fire starting to burn in you. <laughs> Because it was so relevant and you could actually see how it connected to your life and then that's when I actually started becoming motivated and interested in learning in school. Being able to connect my personal experience to what I was learning because most times the things that the teachers are putting up there in front, I, I don't see myself in it. I'm like, where am I in this picture? And then that's when I just automatically switch off. When we relate to something, it makes us want to learn about it. We knew that we we're facing injustices and we knew that we had to learn in order to do something about it. And you can see the transformation how we've come from different backgrounds from different schools and that how we used to think then and then how we've come here and how we've transformed and how we think now and we've finally opened up our eyes to what's really been happening. We have to develop that critical authentic hope in our young people that tells them that you can make change and we're all in this together. So our curriculum is built around that idea, understanding how society works, how do you play that game and how do you change that game and then what tools do you need in order to do that. Developing the skills and the confidence and the pride in your culture foundations and the pride of yourself to be able to respond to it in such a way that is actually going to make a, make a difference. This is what happened to us and now we have come out and saying that we can change it. It's up to you if you want to change it too. If identity and culture are essential ingredients of success at school, then conversely, that's the reverse, you're right, the denial of that identity will significantly impact on that success. So that's a really good, uh, strong piece of evidence there. There's too many messages out there that says to be successful, you need to suppress that cultural element of you. At the Pākehā school that I went to, I learned nothing about Māori. Like, I was learning other history that wasn't mine. When I started this school, the first three weeks, I learned my whole pepeha of my dad's side and my mum's side, and I learned so much history about my own culture that I didn't know. Being Māori doesn't have to mean that you're going to be a failure. In fact, it's a precursor to you being powerful. To achieve as Māori, you have to be strong in your own culture and who you are. Because like, I will be so successful sad. for my family, you know? Everything about that is just about being Māori first. Yeah. knowing who I am, 
to get to where I need to be. The basic social unit in Māori society was the whānau. So the main function of whānau was the procreation and nurture of children. So we're going to be looking at the different whānau environments that Māori have had from pre-colonial colonisation. So what's that? If kids can't be Māori all day, every day at school, learn about their Māori identity, learn about Māori competence and Māori skills and Māori knowledge. If that's not part of what we do at school, then that's not learning. In my family, they like to do kapahaka, yes. Yes, they do. Children bring a whole heap of skills, talent, knowledge, just because they were born Māori. And our job as teachers of Māori children is to develop all of that and extend all of that. That's Te Horonaku. That's where they say he stood when they threw the manuaiti into the sky. Yeah. There's yeah. so many ways that we can include Māori knowledge and knowing and ways of knowing into the academic space. Why can't they be just as rigorous, just as important and just as exciting as Shakespeare and whatever else. We're trying to change the space so that the space fits our kids and they don't have to constantly adjust to fit in. They can come to school and be Māori all day. They can come to school and be Samoan all day without having to change into some school person and then leave again and pick up their identity on their way home. So we set up and, and organise our school differently. We work an integrated curriculum. Teachers work collaboratively in teams. Knowledge belongs to everybody, that you work on it collaboratively and cooperatively together. Those who have the knowledge teach it, it's not necessarily the teacher. Older and younger students work together. Children are working together where there's a whole heap of collaboration, where there's an expectation that people are going to succeed. That's a traditional Māori setting and so those are the sorts of traditional learning environments that we need to create in our classrooms. Create those spaces that work in the way that our kids learn best. We're able to now show in terms of statistics that once our children are confident in themselves, are able to speak their language, are able to be successful in who they are, then what happens as a byproduct, the reading, writing and maths also improves. And that's about knowing who you are and being confident, being who you are and, and celebrating that. So I want them to be able to go into the world with confidence and that to be founded on who they are culturally. To be comfortable, to be Māori, be comfortable around being Pacifica and not feel afraid, not feel like they have to suppress their, their cultural identities to be, you know, to be able to get through the world. It's being able to think universally but still have like a strong hold on your own culture. Become academically strong but also culturally strong at the same time. That's amazing. They, they, they stand tall, they uh, have uh, huge smiles on their faces, they stand proud, they stand tall. scholar someone who's able to achieve and is able to take action against inequalities within the community but also create change from that and also to inspire other people within the community to do the same because we need more people out there actually speaking up and using that voice that they have within them. Otherwise we're going to be continuing to be marginalised all the time and we'll just be oppressed over and over again and the cycle's never going to end. I think you're overwhelmed and, and in despair when you don't have any hope. And, and it's that hope that we have to develop. It's the hope that is what makes change. And our students absolutely deserve and absolutely should have the right to hope for, for a better world, to hope for a better life. They absolutely deserve that. All young people do. Everybody does. And then be given the tools to, to make that hope a reality in their lives. There has to be a way to make change. 
there has to be a way to make change and and I think we have to believe that and uh, I think we have to work towards that and it might be years from now that the change starts to manifest itself but it has to change something has to change